the remarkable research and trends in biomedical engineering. Please do keep in mind that biomedical engineering is a very vast field and there's a constant field of stream of innovations that are coming out, particularly so because of the pandemic. The pandemic actually pointed out the shortcomings in the current healthcare, healthcare system. And there has been a lot of innovations following that to fill in the gaps. So, uh, that, and there has been a lot of tons of research uh, following the innovations as well. Before I go into like the kinds of research that is happening there, uh, just let me tell you this. There is a lot of things that you can do in terms of biomedical engineering. But today we'll be just focusing on three key areas. Using technology for those who you who are hardware enthusiasts and then working with big data and artificial intelligence for those of whom you are more focused towards the software aspects. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the more chem biochemistry or biological parts of bioengineering. Uh, about personalizing healthcare. And then if we have time, let's, I'll show you a bit about some inspiring innovations that I have found, uh, just to give you an idea of what you can do with uh, the little things that you have. So uh, first of all, let's just move into the age of tech. Modern medicine uh, depends a lot on technology. Take for example, an MRI machine. MRI machines actually contain a superconductor inside as well as liquid helium. Do you know that to keep helium at, as a liquid, you need to have a temperature as cold as space. So getting the technology there, getting a magnet, a superconducting magnet there and getting it to work uh, just to get an idea about what's inside your body. That's how far technology has come and that's what that's the level of detail that medicine needs. But it's not always like that. Take for example, augmented reality and virtual reality. Virtual reality and augmented reality are basically getting simulated worlds or getting simulated objects into the real world. These are consumer products, but it has a lot of practical applications. Take for example, the heads up display on your car. I, I don't know if you have seen one, but it's kind of, it projects the speedometer and the uh, statistics of the car, it's for technical terms, uh, onto your windscreen. So you don't have to take your eyes off the road. So some things like that, things, I mean, things like that keeps your attention on what you need to give attention to. So that's what Exhibition has done. They have created a uh, via AR headset, actually, augmented reality headset. Uh, just let me see, just point it out to you guys. Uh, this is what they have made. A headset that sits on top of, uh, that sits on top of your eyes so that you can see inside the body, actually X-ray vision. It's technically not X-ray vision. They are using real-time fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is basically you inject some radioactive components into the bloodstream, and then you uh, detect the radiation that is coming out, and thereby you can see where, like the, where the radiation has spread. So you can get a real-time image uh, out of that, that gives you an idea of what's happening inside the body. But research is going on onto getting pre-recorded images, say for example, an MRI scan or an X-ray scan, on top to overlay on top of the body, which is like purely science fiction, I would say. Just imagine you having Superman vision. You can see inside the body. That's that's what's possible with AR. Another thing that is uh, possible with VR, rather, is giving treatment, especially for mental illnesses or uh, relieving pain. Corona Labs, which is a startup in the US, is doing this. They are giving, like, they're showing uh, simulated uh, environments that are known to reduce the pain levels of bedridden patients. 
who are undergoing chemotherapy, who, are, who have lost a limb, or who are basically paralyzed. You know. They relieve both physical and mental pain. Uh, a friend of mine recently uh, did a final year project in quantifying how emotions change in VR. So things like that. That is like cutting edge research that is currently going on in Sri Lanka. So for a mo- don't even for a moment think that things like this are out of your reach. So that's what Brainstorm is about. Uh, getting you to, like, inspiring you to create innovations for the healthcare industry. Another area, I mean, even you can get involved is in education. Medical students uh, might not always have access to patients or cadavers. Cadavers are the people who they can dissect. So a virtual or a simulated human, which can be taken apart into parts and then put back together, uh, would be really helpful for them. Microsoft HoloLens uh, has a it's, a, it's a platform, it's an AR platform that has, uh, that has support for human models which are used, I mean, even fundamental VR has the same. They have a human model, a 3D scan basically, which medical students can take apart to know which part is that, zoom in, zoom out, uh, remove the skin or, and see what's muscles underneath, then remove the muscles, go down to the bone, enlarge a bone, see what's inside the bone, see how the heart pumps, things like that. That uh, gives some kind of a, like, I mean, there's a better understanding than just reading a book or seeing a video. So that's like, that's what's possible. That's what's happening currently in terms of VR and AR. This is, I mean, in terms of technology, this might not be very complex. I mean, not as complex as an MRI machine for sure, but uh, the things you can do with it are pretty damn cool. So, talking about cool, uh, something that I found really interesting is these human computer interfaces, specifically what Neuralink does. So, here you have this Neuralink chip. This actually goes and sits on top of your brain and it interfaces with it. And this is the battery and the Wi Fi, and it allows you to connect to a computer. I mean, let you control a computer with your thoughts. Yeah. This is science fiction, guys. This is like in the level of science fiction. And this is actually working. Recently, Neuralink published a video showing a monkey playing a game called Pong. Uh, Pong is basically you have a ball moving on the screen uh, like this to the edges of the screen and you have to control uh, uh, a bar so that you can bounce the ball off the screen. So getting a monkey, they trained a monkey to, to do that. And then they implanted the, this chip onto the monkey. And then the monkey was able to control the two bars, the two bars that are going side by side, uh, just with his brain. So uh, this is already here. Yeah, science fiction is here. But um, that is pretty invasive. You have to undergo a surgery. You have to, uh, they have to open the, your skull and put the chip on your brain, which might sound uh, a little concerning for some. So there have been some non-invasive methods that, are, it, uh, that have been developed. Research is going on for that. Even at the University of Maritua, they, uh, they, did, a st- like, they did a study a few years ago about eye tracking, which enabled a fully paralyzed patient uh, to control or type on a screen. So eye tracking and then getting to work, uh, interact with the computer. Uh, then there is work done on getting EEGs. And so without basically without opening your skull, get the brain waves. So EEGs are brain waves. Uh, and get in, using that to interface with your computer. So research is going on and commercial products exist. It works. So uh, there is an opportunity here, uh, not, I mean, 
this might seem out of your range but things like eye tracking uh, or even eeg or even getting uh, i don't know maybe say speech recognition things like that they all come under human computer computer interfaces they allow people who are unable to interact with computers to uh, basically use them so you don't always need a keyboard or a mouse to get to them uh then there is i mean in terms of human computer interfaces then there are something called exoskeletons so i mean i'm sure you have you have heard of it so exoskeletons are basically uh robots or equipment that sits on top of your body that will enable you to do things that are not possible without like not possible naturally or due to disability for example uh sutex and escobionics so this is escobionics exoskeleton uh, allows you to lift or lift jump and not run basically they are not built for speed but uh, still lift and uh, jump higher than what is possible normally things like uh, rewalk companies like rewalk are uh, looking at enabling uh, like a uh, disabled people to walk or enabling para- paralyzed people to walk uh, they are about not about augmenting human strength they are just about get, getting them to work at what is normal so things like that are done at the bionics lab at the university of monaco if you have ever walked down to the mechanical department uh, i don't know if if any of you like, there might be some of you who haven't even gone to campus but if you ever do go to uh, there's this lab just in just uh, just past the canteen uh, upstairs lab upstairs they have created a basically a lower body exoskeleton which allows you to sit i mean that might not seem very interesting but i remember one time when we went to the medical college we asked them what do you need in terms of biomedical engineering and one girl i mean it might be a joke but she said uh it's really annoying to say like stand all the time when we are going for clinicals it would be nice to have a chair to sit right that uh, i mean it might have been a joke but there is a need for things like that so uh, exoskeletons uh, how you use it uh, might open up a new application right? so there might be opportunities here uh next naturally exoskeletons and robots could hand in hand uh robots are coming like being used in medi- medicine mostly due to their precision but now they have enabled uh, new technologies like getting uh, remote surgeries to work or even automated surgeries one of the companies that are doing this is davinci systems uh, or davinci surgeries as they now go they have this uh, robot robotic system which has uh, instruments to open up a person they also have a, a automated table like a robotic table that allows the patient to be moved and then you also have a console where the surgeon sits so it's not perfectly automated i mean completely automated we still need doctors but uh it allows you to i mean it allows the doctor to carry out the operation without actually being the theater so this would allow uh like countries like doctors from different countries to work together so even if you don't have a specialist in your country or in your region a system like this can enable uh, remote surgeries so uh, globalizing medicine or medical treatments another area is like nanobots i mean you might have uh, heard of them we they are, they are very very tiny robots or uh, basically at the uh, cellular level these are being used 
uh, specifically research is being done in getting nanobots to deliver drugs. So targeted drug delivery is, uh, I mean, at times essential because some drugs have side effects. For example, uh, in chem chemotherapy, if you're giving the drug, that might kill healthy cells as well. So you might lose hair. There is a side effects. Uh, but if you have a, a, a army of nanobots that can go there, go to the tumor and release the drug, drug at that location, then you might be able to save, I mean, you might be able to relieve a patient of a lot of pain caused by these side effects. Um, yeah, so those are like uh, pretty advanced stuff. Something that's like in the recent news is these disinfection robots. For example, this QR bot, uh, which is a collaboration between CodeGen and the University of Pera, uh, they, they created this uh, robot that can move around the theater and uh, disinfect basically the surroundings with the UV light. Uh, this, these automated systems were needed due to COVID. So that's what I said at the, uh, at the start of the presentation. The pandemic might have been a really bad thing, but it was a boon for the medical industry. So things like this, they were funded, uh, they received funding much more easily than if it was released before the pandemic. So things like this are happening in Sri Lanka. So you might be able to reach out to them if you need any help. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there are some pretty good uh, experts in robotics at the University of Morocco as well. So uh, another thing that, like, that took a highlight in home healthcare, like during the pandemic is home healthcare. So home healthcare is basically when having medical equipment at your house. So I don't know, there was a time, I mean, at least I remember a time when you didn't have blood pressure monitors or glucose meters at your home. You needed to go to a hospital or a dispensary just to get your uh, blood sugar levels. But now it's at home, right? And I'm pretty sure most of you now have a SpO2 meter or blood oxygen level meter at your house. So things like that, they were used in the field like used in hospitals, but due to the needs of the patients, they have now come into our houses. Uh, low cost models have been developed. Uh, and keep in mind, making a low cost device doesn't mean you are just selling it to third world countries. It has a potential in uh, being sold to the mass market, the general public. So. Think about that when you're presenting, if you're making a low-cost solution, just think about that if it can be used by a day-to-day -day person, like a, a normal human. Uh, one example of this is this Clarius. Clarius is a handheld ultrasound device, which uh, streams the images to your mobile phone, right? So getting a handheld ultrasound to work uh, is a pretty, uh, complex project, but they have done it. Uh, another thing is this ECG. Uh, this might not sound really cool to some of you guys because you know that the watch already has the ECG. But uh, why I put this is Cardia, this little device, doesn't transmit the ECG to the phone uh, via Wi Fi, nor does it use Bluetooth. Right? The funny thing is, it transmits the data, ECG data, as sound, right? The sound is picked up by the microphone of the phone. And the phone does the processing, right? Things like that, uh, I mean, I, I found really impressive. They had thought outside the box to get uh, the data from this to this. Uh, I mean, I would have said, okay, Bluetooth is fine but Bluetooth needs a lot of battery, uh, less than Wi-Fi, but still. This has a battery life of one year, right? Like this little device works for one year. It gets a ECG for one year. So that's 
I found it really cool for for those hardware nerds out there. Ah, uh, yes, this is like the end of the hardware things, but there are some really cool stuff that's going on. So let's go into ah, uh, I mean the software side of things. So working with big data, AI, and making use of what we are collecting, right? So ah, uh, this is something you can try out right now. Uh, if you search for WebMD symptom checker, you get a site where you can enter your symptoms. This is just uh, I don't have an armful. I just put it there just to get a result. Um, so if you enter your symptoms, it will give you a possible diagnosis, right? So things like this are now possible. Uh, earlier you might. you already had to go to doctor i mean I, i'm not saying this replaces a doctor but this is something that can be developed to assist doctors in making diagnosis so things uh, so this this uses uh, basically if you go through a medical textbook there are a set of symptoms that are characteristic of a disease if you program a, a application with those same rules you are theoretically able to uh diagnose uh, so but experience matters so doctors are still better than this but uh, technology is improving and one day uh, you might be just able to say uh, i have this pain in my arm just speak to a device and then it will give you you might have this or you might have this sort of a diagnosis uh so you can you can test it out this is freely available you can uh, even use it if you have a my call or off but remember this is not a replacement for a trained doctor right i'm not taking responsibility if you fall ill and you do the treatment from this so um yeah not not really 100% accurate but research is being done in this area uh, another area where ai is being used is in in a, like augmenting or improving devices for example uh, you might remember this this device the stethoscope but this is not how it is supposed to end the stethoscope has remain like the most used tool by doctors and it has remained virtually unchanged for un about 100 years but now things are beginning to change uh, ai digital stethoscopes such as this echo echocardia device uh, allows you to take a reading and it even analyzes what the sounds mean so something that we are doing at brick is we have created a, a a stethoscope a digital stethoscope and we are working on implementing uh, an artificial intelligence basically uh, a team you might know ramit from your senior batches uh, he's he and a team is working on uh, enabling uh, i mean taking this data and using the sounds from the stethoscope to see if there are heart murmurs or heart defects right so things like this you, you even you can try it out so uh, then ai is used in surgical robots they allow you they allow the surgeon to use natural hand movements and it translates the ai translates that into the machine movements right so uh, you can't always program uh, a machine to move the way it is sometimes you a uh, surgeon might do surprise like sudden movements they might so you have to get rid of that so that you don't damage the patient so for uh, events like that surgical robots uh, use artificial intelligence or basically uh, reinforcement learning there's a concept called reinforcement learning where you uh, train you manually train uh, the robot to do something and then it learns how to do it so things like that are used in surgical robots maybe 
one day automated surgeries might be possible right so yeah so that's possibilities so about robots about data there is a ton of data that is being collected in hospitals there is patient records like how many patients are there who is the patient how many times has he visited things like that are collected as well as uh, the vital signs of a patient and the medication that is given this data can be used to run a wide variety of analysis right uh, for example iqva or this company has used it to test like run clinical trials for their drugs right so you don't have uh, they have used data from millions of patients to model how they would respond to this drug and they have given it to certain patients within in a uh, in a period of time and they have monitored those patients for over a decade so how they do that is by analyzing the pay like hospital visits things like that so um i mean there's a lot of stuff that you can do with the data that is being collected the patient records but uh, it's like uh, uh, there are privacy concerns about what you can do with that data so it's anonymous data uh, you might be able to get some data from uh, from a data set online but i don't think sri lankan hospitals will allow you to but do do take a shot just ask and see uh c glance is like a, a collaboration between the university of jawadhanpur i mean a startup from the university of jawadhanpur they are making an emr solution electronic medical record solution uh, which which we, they are hoping to in, include in uh, data analytics so if any of you are interested uh, just get in touch uh, email let me know uh, i'll okay, open you up so you this is an area where if you search you might be able to find something to do with the data and if you are if you need to find data you can try physionect or something like that where there is uh, some sort of a, uh, some kind of data you, you need uh, talking about physionect there is a lot of biosignal that are being collected in physionect biosignal processing is making sense of that data filtering and getting it out but did you know that with the ppg you can basically extract uh, i mean a lot of different uh, a lot of different information for example the ppg can be used to extract the heart rate the blood oxygen level that is naturally obvious because in the spo2 meter that you have at home you see both of those but research has been research is being done to find the blood pressure using uh, the ppg so there is a concept called the pulse transit time uh, which is basically uh, okay where is the pulse uh, basically the difference between the time a pulse uh, is detected from the heart or to the hand so the difference in timing gives you an idea about how stiff the arteries are so then you can extract this blood pressure out of uh, the ppg you can even extract uh, the respiration rate there is a long term variation for the ppg you can extract uh, once you have the heart rate and the blood pressure you might be able to extract the output volume uh, things like that there is a there is a no there's like ton of research that is being going on using the ppg uh, especially because ppg sensors are really inexpensive so if you if you're using that uh, then there's a lot of areas that you can apply it to uh, but you can also use things like bioimpedance uh, which is used to detect body composition uh, uh, and blood pressure body temperature things like that uh, 
I mean, my final year research was combining SpO2 based PPG temperature, uh, blood pressure, and everything together to get in, like, predict the risk of heart attacks. So things like that are possible. Uh, so I'm, I mean, I am not going to give you a detailed introduction to biosignal processing, but I'm just here to show you what's possible and what's being done. So that uh, just to open your eyes, so you guys can find your way through this. So that's that's quite a lot. Uh, we covered a few, but now I hope I haven't bored you, but uh, if I do, I'm sorry for that. But, so we'll come into some interesting stuff in personalizing healthcare. So uh, you are all familiar with fitness trackers, like from Apple and Samsung. These watches or uh, simply wearables have sensors for heart rate, for ECG, for SpO2, for sleep tracking, for body composition, uh, which is how, how much of fat and muscle you contain. So things, uh, the new Samsung watch has that. So it uses bio impedance. So uh, these things are now coming onto the consumer products, right? So this means there's a trend towards people tracking their own health. So then we can personalize what like the treatment that they have. So how like, through continuous monitoring, such as the DC variable monitors from Philips, monitor your vital signs, uh, 24 7 so in the icu if there is a sudden drop or a sudden deterioration in your condition you know it only if you're continuously monitoring the vital signs of the patient right but this is even uh, more useful in the home setting especially for the elderly they might also need continuous monitoring but uh, they might not need it 24 7 and they might be very concerned about their privacy. So uh, Ray Intelligence is a company I got the chance to go for an internship, but uh, unfortunately it was unpaid, so I turned them down, but they are doing something really interesting. They're using in-house radar to detect uh, where the people are, and uh, this is where the science fiction part comes in. They use it, to detect the vital signs of the patient, the heart rate, the breathing rate, things like that. See, they use it to detect vital signs of a patient in the other room. So here's, what, here's how science fiction, this is even better than science fiction for me. Uh, I never imagined the world where you can uh, measure the heart rate of a patient from the other room. I always thought you needed a sensor uh, on top on the patient or on the subject. So uh, things like this uh, are even beyond imagining. Uh, but I mean, this is, I find it really inspiring and I hope uh, you do too. So uh, now we come to a little bit of uh, chemistry. You might not, uh, you might be a, most of you might be from the, an electronics background. So might not understand some of this, but pharmacogenetics is basically uh, finding a uh, sequence of genome and finding how you would respond to a drug. So you might have noticed some people have severe side effects to medication while uh, it doesn't even work for some, right? So the key to jet lies in your genes. So lies in how you, how fast you metabolize a drug, or how, uh, 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 or even if you have the enzymes to consume the drug, or things like that. So uh, pharmacogenetics is an area where they take the gene, take a sample of your uh, saliva, and they categorize these are the 
treatments that might work best for you. These are the drugs, uh, or these are the drugs that doesn't work for you. So companies like Genlex and Prevail uh, are currently doing this at the commercial level, but research is carried, being carried out to generalize this so that uh, by taking your race or, or where you are from, you might be able to predict, you might respond to this, bit, this drug better. So things like that are like, some might consider it racist, but they are happening for the better or worst. So another thing that's happening for the better or worse is gene therapy. So gene therapy is basically editing your gene genes that are inside the body. So one way of doing it is uh, through viruses. So you intentionally infect yourself with a virus, such as adenovirus, uh, which is a harmful virus that has been, sorry, my bad, harmless virus that has been edited to carry whatever gene that we need to. So that's what they call a vector, a carrier, carrier virus that transports that gene into your cell and use, I mean, it's the nature of viruses to replicate that. So that new gene, which is useful for us, is replicated. So this can this kind of treatment is used, being used to treat genetic disorders, things that uh, might require lifelong medication. Uh, gene therapy has a solution for that. Another way, uh, like another area that gene therapy is being used is in immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is a special kind of gene therapy where you use, uh, I mean, you edit your T cells. There is something called T cells, uh, B cells in your immune system. Uh, they uh, actually destroy certain ty- kinds of cells. So you can edit it to destroy uh, your cancer cells. For example, so what they do is they collect your blood, select whatever stem cells that they have, edit those, and then inject it back. So now you have new blood having those, and we, since they are stem cells, it will replicate, and you'll have a, a set of immune cells that will go and target your and target and destroy your cancer cells. So um, things like this are happening in the world just thought you should know. Uh, I think we are, are we out of time? Okay, okay sure. Uh, yeah, no, we have time. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes and- uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Do this. So another like a cool thing that's happening is bioprinting. You might have heard of 3D printing. This is 3D printing organs and tissues. So that's bioprinting. Um, they have actually successfully printed a heart as well as a kidney. Um, you might wonder why I said kidney after heart, but kidneys are really, really, really complex. They contain microscopic filters called nephrons, of which there are billions and millions in a single kidney. So uh, right now they have both the resolution and the ability to bioprint certain organs. So one day uh, you might be able to uh, make organ just for your own instead of waiting for a donor. So things like that are personalizing healthcare so that you have your own uh, healthy innovation, I mean, healthy uh, medication. So uh, that's it. Uh, I mean, I just take one, one, two minutes just to show you uh, a few innovations that I found interesting. Uh, these are more human-centered designs, such as this solar-powered hearing aid. Uh, it's just a hearing aid, but it's solar-powered so that uh, people who don't have access to electricity, such as in the out- outback, Australian outback uh, in Africa, can. Uh, can actually use the hearing aid uh, without having to replace the battery uh, quite as frequently. Then we have this FlexDex, which is a 
completely mechanical uh, surgical equipment that replaces uh, near i mean gives you the precision of a surgical robot so that uh, that it's a low cost solution for a million dollar surgical robot uh, so things like that are really, really cool and uh, talking about vrs if you can make content uh, take a look at this done by uh, the ogleave marketing agency they have used vr vaccinations to keep children sorry vr to keep children calm while they are being given an injection it's uh, i mean it's interesting to see how children respond right they when like when they previously ran screaming from the room now they waited patiently uh, while they are being injected while they receive the injection so things like that are making a change in this world so this is just to inspire you um yeah that's about it thank you very much